Hello everyone, welcome to PMF IS Current Affairs Prelims Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik. This is your test number 7, part 1. And today in this video, we'll be discussing question 1 to 20. These, this is the first set of questions that we are going to discuss for your test. And uh, so far, in case you have not yet checked the test series, it's high time you should start practicing your MCQ. So we really recommend you to check out the test series of the PMF IS, which is now available at a very special price of 499. So the link is in given in the description below. So just go check out and you can practice 1000 high quality MCQs at a very affordable price. Talking specifically in the context of the test number seven, the very first question which was asked to you was with respect to the art and culture and that too with respect to the uh, temple architecture of India. Very, very important topic. And this is this is this one topic which UPSC is very fond of repeating the themes again and again. If you go and check out the previous year questions, you will find there are n number of times UPSC has asked these kind of questions. But this question was a little bit different from the conventional style where we have asked you about the specific types of the Shikra. Normally, if you look at the temple architecture, the questions belong to the Nagara style, Dravida style, Visara style. But now we have we have gone a little bit deeper uh, into the Nagara style, where in Nagara style we have different sub classification of the temples based on the style of the Shikra that they have, right? So, there are some style of the Shikras that we need to understand, then we'll come back to the question. So, uh, it was it was the Adam Hardy, the very first person who proposed this classification of the Nagara style of temple. Nagara style is that what belongs to the northern part of India, specifically the upper portions of the Vindian, uh, uh, Himalaya, uh, Vindian ranges. And then we have the in south, we have the Dravidin uh, style. In central India, there is a blend of Nagar plus uh, Vis, uh, uh, Dravida that we call as a Visara temple. So Nagara temple, when you think, you, you should think of the temples of the northern India, upper parts of the Vindian ranges. So please remember, that within that Nagara style, the, the Sikhara is very prominent. Sikhara is this, this, uh, this raised platform, raised uh, conical structure that we have directly over the Garbh Griha, where the main deity resides. But within that Nagara style, the Sikhara can be of many, many types. So one very famous type is called the Vallabhi style. Vallabhi style, you can see in the picture, Vallabhi is where the Sikhara is designed not as a conical structure, but it is designed as a barrel structure if you can see as a rectangular shape in design. So this barrel vaulted roof, this rectangular design of Shikhara comes under the Vallabhi style. The best example you can remember is in the form of the Telika Mandir that is very famous uh, temple which was built in the 19th century in Gwalia. Another type of Shikhara can be the Famsana style. As you can see the Famsana is this kind of temple which is comparatively shorter than the regular Vallabhi style. It also has broad structures, broad but short. And the, the very unique point of this kind of Shikhara is the, is the shape of the pyramid that you can see uh, where, the, where, all, where, where you can see one single point above the midpoint of the building. Best example you can think is of the Jagan Mohan uh, of the Korak temple that is built in the Pamsana style. And there is another sub subcategory uh, which is called the Latina but famously called as the Rekha Prasad style. This kind of style is actually the, it is actually somehow influenced by the other two Shikhara style, the Vallabhi and the Pamsana. And uh, in this Rekha Prasad style, if you can see, you have a very, very basic Shikhara, something like this. It's, it's not purely Vallabhi. It's not purely Famsana. It's kind of inspired by the both you can see. And this kind of, this uh, Rekha Prasad uh, style of the Sikhara, the basic uh, uh, structure, it was very prominent till the 10th century in India. Talking about the best examples you can think of, we have the Sun Temple at the Markhera in MP. And we also have the Sri Jagannath Temple in Odisha. Now, if you, if you go back to the question, you will understand there is problem with the first and the second options where Famsana is actually this Jagan Mohan because there you have this pyramidical kind of structure, not exactly this, 
it is supposed to be something like this and in the vallabhi we have the barrel kind of thing that is telika mandir so actually first and second both are being exchanged and the third one is correct the latina we have the jagan uh, street jagana temple that that is in the state of odisha so let me tell you one thing do prepare temple architecture with the utmost honesty because upsc is always likely to ask you the questions from this particular kind of topic so do prepare your temple architecture it's one of the important topic that you can think the question here was a medium level kind of question of course you do not have a guesswork for this kind of questions you need to have a knowledge you can you can take a risk if you have read about it you need to skip if you have absolutely no idea because in this question there no guesswork can help you out because this is purely fact oriented question but just to give you a little bit more uh, information on the nagara style because i believe nagara te uh, temple architecture is likely to be asked in some form or the other in this upcoming prelims so do remember couple of things about the nagara style before we move ahead so if you look at the origin the beginning of the nagara style uh, temple in the northern india it actually started somewhere in the 15th 5th century uh, ad that uh, that evolved in northern india especially during the times of the later gupta period and at the same time we have the development of the dravida style temple also which was developing somewhere in down south but at the same time the north was evolving this nagara style of temple very special usp of the nagara style like like there are a couple of things that you need to remember as a star mark point nagara style always going to be on a raised stone platform there will not be there will be no elaborate boundary walls or the gateways that we have around the temple now this boundary wall concept belongs more to the dravida style of the temples here in nagara style the main tower always going to house the garb griha the the house of the deity and over that garb griha you have the shikhara on the top of the shikhara in nagara style we always have a kalash kalash also called as the amlaka but the kalash is more popular name and uh, then of course nagara is sub classified based on the type of shikhara that we have just understood in the question number 1 and another very important feature of nagara temple is the elaborate murals murals are basically the paintings that we do on the walls the wall paintings of the time are called the murals and uh, yes so we have very uh, heavily decorated walls and all that is very prominent feature of the nagara style right so these are couple of the points that you need to remember here is the picture also this is a picture of a typical uh, nagara style temple you can easily notice this is uh, being your garb griha this is the this is called the sanctum sanctorium the house of the deity on the top of that you can easily uh, see the shikha uh, the uh, shikhara on top of the shikhara you have this this is what you call as a kalash so every feature is quite prominently mentioned here so that takes us to the second question which is question number 2 now question number 2 is a very important current topic in the science and technology because this question is about the graphene graphene is absolutely important star double star mark uh, topic that you need to prepare because it's very much in the news and given the range of its application graphene is one such topic which upsc is definitely going to be interested in asking you in one form or the other so this question was with respect to the graphene you need to learn few facts about the graphene that will come back number one the very first thing that you need to remember about the graphene it is an allotrope of the carbon the first fact is this that you should stick to your head graphene is nothing but a allotrope of carbon what is allotrope le allotrope is basically property of some of the chemical elements where they have this unique property where they can exist in two or more different forms with the same physical state that is called the allotropes so graphene is the allotrope of the carbon graphene we extract it from the graphite so there is a slight difference between graphite and graphene where graph graphite is a three dimensional crystalline structure but when we extract graphene from there graphene becomes a two dimensional crystal with only one atom thickness that's it so graphene in nutshell is nothing but a single layer a mono layer of pure carbon and the most important thing about the graphene is its hexagonal honeycomb lattice you know like every all the uh, uh, all the particles all the atoms of the graphene 
are arranged in a hexagonical and there are many hexagons which make this complete layer but please remember graphene is a two dimensional structure with a negligible height it it only has a breadth and the length that's it where the gra graphite is 3d graphene is actually 2d and this is an excellent conductor of electricity and has a very very high thermal conductivity that is the reason it is one of this particular kind of uh, uh, allotrope is very much in the demand it's mostly uh, used it's widely used i can say and given the fact it has huge application in so many sectors because of this high uh, thermal conductivity and high con being a very excellent conductor of the electricity talking about the graphene please remember graphene is the thinnest uh, compound that we know today but don't think being thinnest it is not a strong one though graphene is the thinnest compound it is the lightest material if you compare it to the paper the normal paper that you have so considering that paper this is almost 1000 times lesser less than uh, uh, this thing a uh, paper but despite and if you compare it with your hair it's even 10 times you know thinner than your hair but when you when you talk about the strength that the graphene possesses it is strongest compound discovered so far its strength is like 100 to 300 times stronger than the steel it is even harder than the diamond but still the lightest and the thinnest compound you can see with this kind of crazy strength and very negligible thickness you can imagine the kind of application we can have with graphene and not just this graphene has one more speciality it is transparent as well as flexible flexible and has a very large surface area that makes it like that makes very easy uh, that's why it is considered to be so much workable you can convert it in the shape you want because it's very flexible and transparent so working with graphene is very easy and that's why many many call it as a wonderful material it is transparent it is strong it is flexible it is light seven times lighter than air thousand times lighter than the paper i told you it is impermeable because graphene is has a zero permeability it blocks all the liquid and gases right and it, it has high thermal conductivity the the uh, thinness is less than a hair so imagine that's why this is called the wonderful wonderful material and no wonder with so many properties you will find the application of graphene in almost every sector electronics you can use it from electronics to biomedical devices even in the conductivity business biomedical industries automobile industries in in the medical field graphene is used for targeted drug delivery or smart implants in automobile sector we can use it uh, for let's say uh, it can act as a corrosion barrier between the oxygen water diffusion because you see it has no permeability that's why it can keep the oxygen water quite different and of course it has potential uh, alternative to the lithium ion battery that we are using today we have questions on lithium also so again it's a very important question so now if you look at the question all the four statements which were given were actually correct yes so i highly recommend you to please and please prepare the graphene topic read about it more and more because it's one of the most important topic you should prepare for the upcoming exam so answer here here, here has to be a uh, d it was an easy question very straightforward question uh, could have been dealt very easily without any problem now takes that takes us to the question number three now this question three was little little bit crazy question because uh, we are talking about the oil sands so why this is an important question because it was in news for many many reasons so what exactly is the oil sand that you need to understand and then we'll talk about uh, the question in bit of detail well talking about the oil sand oil sand also has a very popular name called the tar sand so be prepared upsc may ask you question on the oil sand upsc may ask you question on the tar sand as well so this oil sand or the, or the tar sand is nothing but a mixture of sand plus clay plus water and the bitumen considering the four combination makes it absolutely important uh, uh, sand that naturally occurring uh, as a petrochemical element 
so oil sand is nothing but a form of bitumen which is very very heavy liquid um, uh, with the with the very low melting point bitumen is used for the road construction that you know it uh, as a most common use so this oil sand that we're talking about it is a it's a naturally occurring petrochemical can be upgraded into crude oil but for that of course you need to have more uh, its extraction it has to be refined so yes it is a potential source to the crude oil as well and no wonder that's why uh, countries like canada and venezuela they have the largest deposit of the tar sands in the world and they currently are trying to get the best of the crude oil from these oil sand these tar sands where where you have the potential crude oil of course in order to extract there can be two ways if if you have this sand if the tar sand is very near to the surface you don't have to dig deeper then even an open pit mining can be done where horizontally you can simply remove the uh, surface uh, and you can extract the uh, this oil sand but if you have the presence of the tar sand as a as a as a it's it's very deeper into the ground then you have to go for the in situ mining which is mostly vertical and we are trying to get down deeper and deeper to extract the bitumen that we have so basically two types are there if you if you look at the picture you will get the best understanding of the how this whole oil uh, uh, from the tar sands is extracted you see this is the way if it is too deeper we go go for in situ in fact 80% of the uh, reserves of the tar sands they are deeper that's why 80% is extracted with the help of in situ conservation if it is if it is uh, not that deeper we can go with the open mining kind of thing so if you look at the question the question has one problem and what one problem it has first question is correct okay fine as the name says oil and the sand remember apply your common sense what oil and sand can be it can be nothing but a mixture of these four very obvious kind of thing bitumen may have this problem but yeah somehow somehow you can connect the problem is with the second one because in the countries like saudi arabia and qatar they are not having the largest deposit they have the direct crude oil excess no their major thing is that they have a direct crude oil extraction they are not dependent on the oil sand or something like that so clearly you have seen when it comes to the largest deposit of the oil sand the tar sand you have the canada and the venezuela as the two countries so yeah second is incorrect so answer uh, has to be only one so yeah this was an easy question but you could have attempted because you know saudi and qatar do not really have to be dependent on the oil sands uh, you have the oil sands in the countries like canada and venezuela that takes us to the question number four with respect to the lithium i told you it's a very important question and we also keep on asking you questions on lithium again and again because it is very important topic that you should prepare guys so few facts that you need to understand and uh, few things that i need to tell you about the lithium so it's a it's a very very magical uh, element that we have to deal with so lithium few facts the quick fact that you, you need to remember Number one, lithium. Whenever you think of the lithium, the very first thing that comes to your mind is nothing but the lithium-ion batteries. If I'm not wrong, right? So lithium-ion is the first thing that comes to our mind. So yeah, it is used in batteries. But why? Why it is used in batteries? That is very important thing. Lithium is basically non-ferrous. Non-ferrous does not have the presence of the iron. Simple. It is soft. It is silvery white alkali metal. That's why. lithium has a very famous name called as the white gold if you ever have has a question on the white gold it is nothing but the uh, nothing but the lithium lithium is known as the white gold due to its high demand for the rechargeable batteries that we just have understood under lithium is the least dense metal and least dense solid element now this is a very important fact that you may find in upsc in one form or the other but having said so having said that it has application widely across the rechargeable batteries let me tell you lithium never ever occur freely in the nature that means lithium is always going to be find in some kind of combination it does not occur freely as an individual as a stand alone kind of thing so 
लिथियम लिथियम अकर्स मेनली एज अ पेगमेट पेगमेटाइटिक मिनरल वट इज अ पेगमेटाइटिक मिनरल इट्स अ कोर्स टेक्स्चर इग्नियस रॉक्स दैट फॉर्म ड्यूरिंग द फाइनल स्टेज ऑफ द मैगमा क्रिस्टलाइजेशन सो सच रॉक्स विच आर विच आर फॉर्म एट द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ मैगमा क्रिस्टलाइजेशन आर कॉल्ड द पेगमेटाइट मिनरल एंड सिंस दे आर फॉर्म इन द एंड दैट्स वाई दे आर लाइकली टू बी कोर्स टेक्स्चर द pegmatitic minerals contain large crystals and mineral which are rarely found in other type of rock and there you have this lithium which is found which is present mainly occurring in the pegmatitic minerals very interestingly when you think of lithium i know the very first few things that come to your mind is the lithium triangle we all have heard about the lithium triangle so many times where we have the bolivia where we have chile where we have argentina we find that's fine but that lithium triangle don't get confused with the production lithium triangle is a word used for the reserves of lithium so when it comes to reserves yes we have lithium triangle which has more than 50% of the reserves i'm talking about the producer the question is about the production not like i'm having so and so how much you are producing right now when it comes to the production it is australia at number 1 chile being number 2 china being number 3 fourth argentina fifth zimbabwe at least you are you should be in a position to remember the first five of anything so first five is important so now if you look at the look at this uh, uh, you know if you go back to the question there you have the first two statements being the correct one no problem so third is incorrect yes it does not occur freely and chile is clearly not the top production chile is at number 2 yeah reserve wise yes lithium triangle we have no doubt but production wise it is australia then chile then you have the china so at least remember this much so here uh, you need to eliminate number 2 third and fourth not correct medium kind of question first second to very very easy statement even third is very statement and fourth we all know little bit confusing with the lithium triangle but don't get into the trap read the statement carefully so very easy uh, uh, it could have been attempted easily without any trouble guys now if you go back to the question point now we have the next question number 5 very important question straight away with 0 0% guess work chance no guess work history how would you guess you have the kharsavan kharsavan movement it relates to was it was that an agricultural reform no the kharsavan was not even urban development not about industrial expansion kharsavan is more of a tribal rights tribal autonomy let me tell you now there is only one thing that i can think and guess please understand if you look at if you read the modern history or if you have read the modern history you know there were other than the normal course of the freedom struggle we also had many many movements and rebels right so we have we have lots and lots of the peasant movements we have lots and lots of the tribal movements civilian movements right so mostly in such cases where you have this kind of question please first try to eliminate that cannot be the answer i mean industrial cannot be the part urban development definitely not so most likely this could be agricultural this could be tribal i would say 70% chances would be that the upsc will target the tribal one but still 30% can be agricultural too but at least since you have eliminated these two options now you have a 50-50 chance with a 50-50 chance i can clearly take a risk despite the question being tough i can still make a guess work if i have if i had to guess i would definitely would have given the answer as b even if i do not know about the kharsavan movement a lot let me tell you kharsavan is a very very important history in the independent india let me tell you guys i mean there was a time in 1948 when uh, the area of the kharsavan along with other 24 princely states it was decided by the union of india that the kharsavan along with all these princely states should be merged with the state of odisha that was the thing but most of the adivasis 
of the Kharsavan area and the nearby areas, they were op they were opposing this merger. They did not want to be a part of Odisha. They did not also want to be part of Bengal, uh, Bihar. The Kharsavan people, the tribal people of that area, they were actually desiring a separate state. That state they demanded was actually the state of Jharkhand, which was given by the Indian government in 2000. The demand was there in 1948. Understand? So despite the voices of the people were, were not heard, unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, they got, they gathered, they organized a, a kind of protest in 1948. It was 1st January 1948. Large gathering organized in the state, in the area of uh, Kharsavan, which is present in Jharkhand. They were protesting the merger and they were putting demand of a separate state. But then what happened was very unfortunate. In this independent India, the Odisha military police came, fired and they actually massacred as per some of the records the number could be as high as 2000 individuals that were killed which were doing nothing but they were protesting that's it the police opened fire at the crowd and this kharsavan massacre or kharsavan goli hatyakan that we also call in hindi this is considered to be the first uh, or the or the uh, uh, independent India Jallianwala Bagh because we know similar thing has happened in 1919 Jallianwala Bagh also but that was a case of pre-independent India. Kharsavan is the case of post-independent India and this whole protest and opposition was a part of the Praja Mandal movement but lot of things were crushed and they were crushed like nothing before. Understood? So now you have the option as B is the right answer. That takes us to the question number six. The question very careful. The question asks, which of the following statement is not correct about the Adi Shankaracharya? Adi Shankaracharya has always been a very important topic of the UPSC exam. But considering the kind of controversy that has recently erupted uh, during the Ram uh, Mandir uh, you know, inauguration, was uh, the statements given by the by the four Shankaracharyas. So clearly Adi Shankaracharya could be a very important topic that you should prepare. Was he propounder of Adit, uh, Advait philosophy? Yes. Uh, we have a statue of oneness of the Adi Shankaracharya in MP. Yes, that, that's also correct. Uh, Bhajan Govind's Truth and Nirvana Sh uh, Shatkam are the major works of Shankaracharya? Yes, absolutely. The only problem is with the statement number three. The followers of Adi Shankaracharya are not called as the Shankaracharyas. Shankaracharya is the name of the four leaders that we have in the four different directions of the country. Right? Now, very interesting question. So, first you need to understand and know a lot of facts about Shankaracharya, then we'll come back. So, talking about Shankaracharya, we know he this this uh, he was a great philosopher a saint and a reformist also in one way or the other so adi shankaracharya has most of the contribution and his his biggest contribution in the uh, in the domain of philosophy was the advaita vedanta it was the theory it was it was the idea given by adi shankaracharya please remember this idea it is one of his significant work well, when Adi Shankaracharya contributed and propagated his idea of the relationship of God and the man, and he came up with the Advait Vedanta, that actually this philosophy actually means the non-dual nature of reality. That is, the individual Atma is same, identical to the supreme reality that is Brahman. So Atma Paramatma, right? So as per this concept. There is no difference between an individual soul and the supreme reality. That's why Advaita Vedanta is also called as non-dualism. It's a policy of non-dualism. Right? Adi Shankaracharya believed that individual supreme, they are, they are very similar or comparable to the ocean and the waves. As you can't distinguish the characteristic of a wave and the ocean, both has the same characteristic. 
the wave appear different in the ocean but in reality it has the same water substance and same is the case with the individual and the supreme being the supreme reality up over there other than uh, advait vedanta he also gave the concept of the nirgun brahman which is the formless worship or the god without attributes that was his contribution as well you must remember uh, to supplement his ideas he wrote a lot of literature adi shankaracharya's major work are these four where we have uh, the major four, uh, the major works as the brahm sutra bhas or the bhaj govind stotra the nirvana uh, the shatkam and the prakaran granth all the four are the works of shankaracharya problem was with the third statement you just understood the followers of shankaracharya they are called as the smritas shankaracharya word means the teacher of the way of shankara this shankaracharya right now it is only used as a religious title by the head of the four cardinal peet the four shankaracharya peet that we have one being in dwarka other being in uttarakhand then we have in odisha and then we have in karnataka in the four directions and you have the names also in front of you you never know you may have a question on the match the following kind of thing so at least read about these four mutt or the these four uh, peet that we have and these mutt these four they were founded by adi shankaracharya himself somewhere around the 8th century or somewhere around that time clear everyone okay so yes and here we have this is the statue of oneness in madhya pradesh uh, it was established um, on the mandhata mountain on omkareshwar which lies in the uh, khandwa district in madhya pradesh so yes if you look at the question you have the answer adi shankara's followers are not shankaracharyas shankaracharya charyas are the name of the head because this was very much in the news so i expect this question being medium but still you should be able to eliminate at least other four are very other three are very very famous so only option is the c one so you could have attempted it that way answer has to be c very very important so now you look at the question number 7 it question number 7 was with respect to the classical languages again you have lots of questions coming on the classical language where in constitution you have the mention of the word classical languages well if you have to read about that go back to the uh, go you have to go back to the schedule eighth schedule of indian constitution so eighth schedule is all about the scheduled languages right now in india there are there are say 22 scheduled languages but the question is about the classical language not the scheduled one so be careful though we have 22 languages add as the scheduled languages but when it comes to the classical language tag there are only six classical languages that we have recognized in india and there we have tamil there we have sanskrit the kannada telugu malayalam and odisha and you can see the chronology as well tamil was the first language to be declared as classical way back in 2004 sanskrit and canada were in 2005 and 8 respectively telugu also shared the same year as the kannada malayalam got its tag in 2013 odia got its tag in 2014 remember this is absolutely important so there are six classical languages that we have and which particular language should be called as classical this again is a million dollar, dollar question i mean how would you decide if this language is classical or not classical language is basically language with original independent literary traditions and also having a large body of the ancient written literature well that's what you call as the classical language in india we have this number as 6 right which ministry is taking care of all this so well when it comes to the ministry it is ministry of culture remember so because we are talking about the language we are talking about the classical language so very logical which ministry has to be a part ministry of culture it provide the guidelines regarding the classical languages in ministry of uh, culture you have all these uh, provisions 
you know all the record and everything is there remember recently why this question came into the limelight because when west bengal chief minister requested prime minister to recognize bengali as a classical language but so far it has not got its tag maybe in future if bengali got get gets this tag of a classical language that will become the seventh classical language of india but right now it is just six that we have i hope this is clear to everyone if this question is clear now if you look at the statement guys you, you have to come back so clearly you can eliminate the third statement says recently bengali language got the classical no it is still pending it is still pending so third is not correct first and second correct answer has to be only two clear so this question medium level but uh, uh, you can take a risk because at least the first two statements are comparatively easy statements all you have to try to eliminate the questions or the lines as much as you can now next we have the question number eight question number eight which says now this question is very simple i think this was the most easy question of the first 20 questions that we are discussing the question is about explain deglobalization what the, what could be deglobalization it is nothing but simply the opposite of globalization it is simply reverting the gains of globalization is deglobalization so you just have to give the answer with a very common sense in the globalization what happens globalization means we are we are going to get more interlinked by the global economy there would be more global cooperation there would be more integration in, into the indian market and we also will get the access of the other markets so in globalization you have all these concepts so deglobalization is you are going to cut the ties with the world you are not interested in global cooperation you are not interested in anything like that so clearly what is a globalization can global can deglobalization be about increasing the global cooperation no we are cutting off from the global cooperation so this statement is actually correct for the globalization similarly second uh, third fourth statement says greater reliance on cross border trade no absolutely not in for for having greater reliance on cross border trade again the rescue weapon is globalization is it about stronger transnational partnership trade liberalization no it will lead it this deglobalization with i will actually eventually delink your economy from the global world so you are not going to get international recognition as a strong one no at not at all so option b is only correct reduced international cooperation yeah that is actually the meaning of deglobalization reduce the international connections and more protectionist policies well that was a very simple question easy could have attempted all you need to do is keep globalization into the mind versus deglobalization so whatever he has done or whatever are the advantages of this is going to be just the opposite of the deglobalization so simple question could have been attempted very very straightforward now that brings us to the question number 9 Question number nine was again a very clear question on lithium triangle. We just have discussed. We have just discussed in the question number four, if I remember it correct, third or fourth. So now you even you can give the answer right now. I explained lithium triangle, Argentina yes, uh, Chile yes, but not Paraguay, not Uruguay. It has to be Bolivia, yes. So the this is a pure map based question, pure map based question. so here any guess work no guess work sir you have to risk it you can attempt it only if you have read about it can you but in my opinion this overall question was an easy question why because lithium triangle is very very famous very much in the news that's why i am putting it in easy category but yeah the map based questions are i would say they are always always tricky so be very very careful about that okay so you can see the diagram here you can clearly see the diagram so these three countries so here we have the bolivia we have the chile and we have the argentina so this this entire area this entire area is called the lithium triangle you have the maximum number of lithium reserves like almost around 
uh, almost 50 more than 50 percent now why why lithium triangle is in news these days because of india only yeah india has announced exploration and development of the five lithium blocks in argentina so that means argentina which is a part of triangle lithium triangle so yes this is absolutely correct these three the argentina plus uh, bolivia plus chile they are more than half of world's total lithium reserves now india is going abroad to mine the lithium yeah which particular branch of india the kabil branch which is khanij bidesh india limited which is kabil so kabil is going to have these exclusive rights on the exploration and mining of uh, the mines uh, you know in, a, in in argentina that's that's important you may have a question coming directly on the Kabil as well. This Kabil itself is a very important point. It is nothing but a joint venture company between the Nalco, HCL and MECL. This is absolutely important thing that you need to prepare guys. That brings us to the next question. Another map based question that we have to fix. Now this question now is about the, you have to figure out the land border with Iran. So again, this question cannot be done without understanding the map, guys. If you look at the Iran here, Iran, again, very, very much in the news for all right and wrong reasons, mostly wrong reasons, uh, supporting a lot of rebel groups and all. Iran border, if you see land boundaries, so start with Pakistan, Afghanistan and Turkmenistan. These three from Asia. Then you have the Azerbaijan, Armenia. Please remember this is turkey and please remember iran share its boundary with iraq no problem but not with syria at all syria is quite far away you see there is no border between iran and syria similarly do not forget to see here even georgia does not have any boundary with iran uzbekistan does not have any boundary with iran right and then then you have iraq Iraq is there okay fine then you have uh, but please remember even Kuwait is not not a part of this clear so now you know the answer so clearly you can eliminate so you can you can eliminate based on the knowledge of your map so Syria clearly not Uzbekistan no all four are correct so answer has to be only four easy question could have been attempted but but star mark question what if only if you can solve it if you have read your maps carefully so i request you humbly and very sincerely kindly read your maps don't keep your atlases you know well ragged in your bookshelf don't do that atlas are meant to be dirty dirty with lots of points written on them so try to use that knowledge in your exam very very important guys right now that brings us to the next question which is question number 11 question has a very important uh, uh, topic in it that is the sahel region you think of sahel region you need to transport your mind into the continent of africa so let's have a ride of africa learn about sahel we'll come back so the word sahel don't get confused this word is now right now it is written as sahel a sahel region but it is also called used to be called as the Sahel region in Arabic. Sahel or Sahel is nothing but the coast or the shore that they used to name. So why this is a Sahel region? You see, this is a Sahel also. Why? Because it actually stretches from Atlantic to the Red Sea. If you look at the map of Africa, you will get to know a lot of things. Looking at the map of Africa, you have the Sahara Desert on the top, on the north side. Then you have this is the Savannah region that you have. And there in between the Sahara and Savannah, if you, if I'm just trying to, uh, just to give me, let me change the color. If you look at this particular, this whole region, which is actually sandwiched between the Sahara Desert and uh, you can call 
the savanna is this particular area now this region is called sahel region how many countries are covered it spreads across the 12 countries this sahel region spreading right from this arabic uh, atlantic to the red sea it it goes past like this i mean this this is also part of uh, you say part of sahel region only so remember this these three locations are to be remembered so how many countries and and i want you to to let uh, tell in the comment box i want you guys to give a comment how many countries do we have under sahara desert because sahel to we just have learned 12 but how many countries are covered by the sahara desert do let me know in the comment section below now talking about this particular uh, question so how many uh, countries for sahel there are only 12 countries not 15 not 20 there are 12 countries that are part of sahel region uh, that approximately is a home of a 40 crore people that live in the sahel region sahel region cl climatologically if you see it's a semi arid region of course but because it towards the savanna it is more wet towards the sahara desert it's more dry so sahel is in between the two so it's it is supposed to be semi arid region right uh talking about the g5 sahel which is a core of the sahel region so these five countries you never know you may have a question you may have a potential mcq on that coming so mali niger burkina faso chad and mauritius mauritania these five countries together form the g5 sahel which is a which is the core of the sahel region but why we are talking about sahel so much the sahel region of africa not to forget this region is absolutely rich in natural resources like oil uranium natural gas even lithium please look uranium natural gas lithium look at the charges and the oil as well so that make every sense that that this particular line makes you understand the economic importance of the sahel region yes or no this gives you this idea why this region is absolutely important for us clear so now in this question question number 11 first and third being correct second is incorrect it's the problem is with the number of the countries so how many countries 12 okay it's a fact based information but at least the first and the third i expect you to learn and to know and solve with the common sense so clearly 15 is not the right answer so answer has to be only two medium level question it was you could have risked it if at least you are aware of the two of the three statements at least if you have no clue at all then better to skip than going into the negative traps sahel of course the entire african region is resource rich it is mineral rich so why not sahel is going to have the minerals yes of course it does make sense okay question number 12 now question 12 is again a map based question talking about the luzon strait where which two water bodies are connected by luzon strait i hope so far you are quite comfortable with the word strait strait is nothing strait is nothing but a, a, a narrow water body connecting the two larger water bodies that is the definition of a strait so where is this strait you need to check on the map look at the map yourself so here on the map of southeast asia you can see this narrow water body is called the luzon strait luzon strait connecting the two larger water bodies one south china sea another is the philippine sea right so this luzon strait and uh, if you if you look at from the other perspective luzon is basically nothing but an easy way to remember if you look at the uh, map of philippines the northern side the northern island of the philippine is is called the luzon island and based on its name only you have the luzon strait that actually separating taiwan and the luzon island you remember that and since already this uh, south china sea is comparatively most disputed island it is so that makes every question related to this a bit more important guys right so if you if you go to the question absolutely straight forward answer no scope nothing uh, that you can think so yes it is the south china sea and the philippine it's purely purely map based absolutely no guesswork here 
in this case it was an easy question very straight away question that we could have attempted because luzon strait was in news for many many reasons for the increasing chinese activity in that particular region another important topic that we are reading from like almost like like last 8 years we have got the chabahar port question but this question was little bit more difficult than you expected why let's understand about the uh, chabahar port if you look at the map again go to iran going to the iran you see this is the port called chabahar port this chabahar port was developed by iran with the help of india largely india has invested a lot at the chabahar port why because if right now if india has to uh, deal or india has to do business with the central asian countries pakistan never allows us to go from their side that's why we are looking for the alternative and now we have got this opportunity uh, with this alternative india has developed this chabahar port so clearly the uh, from from gujarat from maharashtra we are going to reach chabahar from the chabahar we will enter afghanistan bypassing surpassing pakistan all together and from afghanistan you can actually go to turkmenistan without any problem so that is the idea this is one idea number 2 look this is a gwadar port this belongs to pakistan this gwadar port built by china so clearly you have the chinese and the pakistan presence at gwadar and that's why we have got the chabahar port even more important so chabahar is in iran but the purpose is almost the same clear everyone right okay just give me a second okay i think this is this much is clear okay now clearly talking about the position once again you look at the chabahar and here this is your persian gulf you have to come out of the persian gulf there is a very narrow very narrow strait called the strait of hormuz this location is called the strait of the hormuz and from there you have to get again to the wider water body called the gulf of oman so looking at the position you can clearly see chabahar is located at the mouth of gulf of oman clear it's almost 170 km from the pakistan gwadar port uh, normally if you look but if you if you look at this distance it is even less than 100 km by road and all connectivity you have the distance so clear everyone fine fair enough uh two very important facts about the chabahar that i want you guys to remember for a longer time chabahar is iran's only oceanic port yes it's true it was also the first deep water port absolutely true again and because thanks to chabahar it's not just in in india's interest Chabahar port is also important for Iran's perspective because that is their only oceanic port also a deep water port that actually puts Iran on the global oceanic trade route map and you never know because of the Chabahar even the trade uh, of Iran can increase for so many folds within Chabahar complex you have the two important ports Chabahar is a port complex within that two major ports we have one is called the shahid kalantari port and the second called the shahid behasti port both are very very important okay and it was in 2016 where india iran and afghanistan all the three signed their trilateral agreement to rapidly develop uh, the chabahar port so even afghanistan has become a party in 2016 this chabahar does not restrict itself to the economic relations of the two countries the chabahar port is a is a multiple perspective port it not only just boost the tide trade but also going to be boosting the diplomatic ties between india iran uh, and also the military ties with the with the two countries so chabahar is absolutely important strategically economically in in every perspective and why i have already shown how india can go and of course being because it's very very close to the uh, uh, gwadar port 
which is built by China in in Pakistan. Also, India has this. Uh, India also wants to observe the port quickly because we really do not want any suspicious activity not to happen with the Gwadar port and uh, to make India more secure from any kind of thing. So yeah. So first is wrong. Of course, we just have understood Chabahar is not at mouth of Persian Gulf, but it is at the mouth of the Gulf of Oman. We just have learnt it from the map. No, the so first is wrong. Second and third. Yeah, correct. Answer is only two. See, second and third are quite simple. But yeah, of course, I have one one doubt. Uh, many times the statement like only and all most of the times they are wrong. In this case, for a change, this was a right statement. So yes, you have to be a little bit careful while solving. Some things are correct, some things are not. Third is very obvious. Why the two countries are going to agree to any port? Very obvious kind of thing. So I think this question was, uh, I would say it was a medium one, little bit medium one, but overall could have been attempted easily. Because at least two informations you need very clearly. Okay. Next question we have is with respect to the International Court of Justice, better known as the ICJ. So why this is so important? Uh, let's try to learn something about the ICJ and then we'll come back to the question guys. Now please remember few facts that you need to carry in your memory. You think of International Court of Justice, you have to think of 15 total judges that we have. So these 15 judges of at the International Court of Justice, we have to make sure that it those 15 must not be having uh, judges from the same nationality means 15 judges, 15 different nationalities. But again, if you are working as a judge at the ICJ, you are not going to represent your government or your country. If you are working as a judge in the ICJ, you are working as an independent magistrate. Every judge is elected for a term of nine years. Can they be re-elected? Uh, yes. The retiring judges, they are eligible for re-election. There is no bar onto that. How judges are selected? Judges are actually elected by the UN General Assembly and Security Council. It's not like any one body. There are two most important bodies of the UN they only select the judges uh, for the ICJ that is there. I hope that makes sense to everyone. And uh, every decision is taken at the absolute majority of the votes by both the bodies. So this is one statement. Again, please remember when you think of the ICJ, only the countries, only the member states, they are eligible to appear before the court in any of the cases. I mean, it's not like, like I have any problem as an individual, can I go to ICJ? No, no, not at all. ICJ has no jurisdiction to deal with the application from individuals or any NGO or any corporation or any private property entity. They're not allowed. ICJ will not entertain this kind of thing. Only the state governments, only the state, the government part, they are only allowed to go and represent their case at the ICJ, not common people like you and me. Very interesting thing, whenever an ICJ gave any of its ruling, the rulings of the ICJ are going to be binding. Yes, you have to make sure that they are binding. They Can they be appealed by member state? No. The court ICJ rulings are binding and cannot be appealed by member state. But of course, it depends on UNSC to enforce the decision. So finally, the enforcement part of the decisions taken by ICJ are to be, uh, you know, are to be passed or decided by the United Nations Security Council, UNSC. So now if you look at the question, you will find, sir, every statement has a problem. So clearly, we know that when it comes to the ICJ judges, Yes, there are 15 judges selected for nine years, fine. But are they going to be selected only, solely by UN Security Council? No. Along with UNSC, we also have selection uh, process approved by the UN General Assembly. So two bodies are there, not the one. So one is not correct. Then second is also not correct because it says indiv even individuals can uh, take up their case. That is also not correct. 
ICJ has power to make measure to enforce? No, it does not. Decisions are binding, but enforcement to be done by other agencies, not the ICJ. So in this case, all the three statements are absolutely correct, uh, incorrect. So which statement is correct? None, none of the above, because I see all the three are incorrect. Clear everyone? So this kind of question, yes, it was, I would say it was a tough one. Undoubtedly, it was a tough one. But still you have somehow, at some level, you have the hints. If you have the hints, you can still take a little bit of risk and you can still solve this question. Like for example, you can, you can easily understand why only security council is going to select the International Court of Justice, where you, where you know you have the UN General Assembly also as an important body. So with common sense, you can question mark this, this option, right? So here, none is correct, answer is D. I hope this is clear to everyone. That brings me to the question number 15, which is about the non-alignment movement. Okay, you have to figure out the correct one with respect to the non-alignment, fine. So what exactly non-alignment? For understanding non-alignment, you really have to transport yourself in 1950s and 1960s. What the name itself says a lot, non-alignment movement. I'm not aligned to him, I'm not aligned to him, I'm neutral. That is the very common meaning of the non-alignment, right? Non-alignment movement was actually group of the states that was not formally aligned or against any major bloc. That was a time when the Cold War was at, at its peak. And every country was, was somehow directly, indirectly asked to take up the sides. Either you have to stand with USA or with USSR, not officially, but this was a kind of thing that was going on. Talking about the non-alignment movement, at the time when the Cold War as it speak, like few countries, they decided not to be part of any power bloc. And to make sure that the some countries have this luxury of staying neutral, not being a part of any of the power bloc. Considering that idea, it was 1955 when uh, there was a conference that was held in Bangdung. Bangdung is a place in Indonesia. And that's why from, the, from this meeting of these countries, we have got the 10 Bangdung principles, which is all about this non-alignment movement. Finally, after this meeting, finally it was 1961 in Belgrade, Serbia, where as a movement opposed to the East-West ideological confrontation of the old of the Cold War. So 1961 onwards, it has got its formal shape. Now, there were five countries, the five initial founding fathers of the non-alignment movement, which does not matter how much criticized is uh, uh, you know, you, you read about the non-alignment movement, I will tell you, this was one of the important thing that India has done. Non-alignment movement, lot of people do not read about them, about it, or the contributions of other uh, uh, people. So this non-alignment was actually the original idea or founding feathers were the five countries. So you have, if let's say you have this question, which of the following are the five core members of the NAM? It has to be Egypt, it has to be Ghana, India of course, we have Indonesia and Yugoslavia. So these were the five countries which are the core member, the founding members of the non-alignment movement. And India is one of that, that you have understood so far. Please remember, this whole non-alignment movement, which started with only five members, now it has more than 120 members. Approximately 60% countries are a part of non-alignment movement. They do not want to be part of any power block. NAM is this, this all movement. It is absolutely without any formal administrative structures, without or even without a budget. Objective is very clear. National independence, sovereignty, territory, integrity, security of the non-alignment countries in their struggle against the imperialism, colonialism, neonism, racism, and because of such comprehensive, such wide objective, NAM is still so much relevant in our exam. Make sense? Why we are reading about the NAM for after so many years? Now, if you look at the question, guys, yeah, 
all the three statements are absolutely correct yes it was 1961 non alignment movement mainly to oppose this east west ideological east was all about the ussr west was all about the usa so this to counter these two narratives a third narrative was introduced it does not have any formal st structure that's correct and uh, it has more than 120 yeah, precisely around 120 members question was a medium one i understand i do not uh, disagree over that maybe you have this problem with second statement some people will say but i don't think that this question could not be attempted nam is a very popular topic with india being a founding member and considering the relevance i think this is very important topic that everyone should prepare non alignment movement don't skip this topic at all that takes us to the question number 16 which was the group of the 77 the g77 group now be careful the question is about which statement is not correct at all so g7 okay now very logical very logical the question says so at least you at least you can think if anything is like g20 or 30 or 70 the word actually somehow means the membership no the number in such groups denotes the membership right think think about logically if you have a group of 77 countries let's say do you think that 77th country which is g7 yes it is largest intergovernmental organization true but do you think such group can be formed outside the un which is very unlikely very unlikely 77 countries today they are not going to afford this cost of you know making everything outside un no because because the member of the 77 g77 are also they are also the member of the un yeah that's fine that's correct so clearly this first one cannot be the right answer ab uh, now now the second question is definitely a big question mark does it does it has 70 uh, 135 member or not that we need to figure out that we need to figure out but first at least i can tell you is wrong now please remember so clearly why first was wrong G77 first key point intergovernmental organization of developing countries but that is within UN not outside it it was 1964 when 77 developing countries they decided to have their own group as a better collective voice so that international economic issues can be understood better and all the 77 countries are going to strengthen and support each other for the collective economic interest the name g77 is still the same name but don't think only 77 members are there talking about the membership right now it has more than 135 member states more than 135 member states that makes it even more important question since the question was about not correct so clearly the first one is not correct this was your key this was your hint you are supposed to pick it up So yes the statement is second is correct one is not correct so not correct is e not correct clear so this question again medium but could have been attempted easily little bit of gut feel you could have solved it next question number 17 is what we have now question 17 is about the joint comprehensive plan of action called the jcpoa Now, talking about the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, we have we have read about it so many times. You go back to the question 2015, 2016. This was the hot topic of that time, right? Okay. So this just to make you little bit just make to make you things little bit easy. The formal name is Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. What was the what was the simple common name? This was the Iran nuclear deal. now if you remember everything clearly the unofficial name or the common name was iran nuclear deal and this formal document was called joint comprehensive plan of action so yes the first statement this was an agreement between iran and p5 plus 1 yes p5 are the permanent five members of un security council china france russia us uk but what is this plus 1 other than these five countries another country was added and was made part of the negotiation but it was not italy sir no sir the fifth country that was added as a as a uh, under the iran nuclear deal it was not italy it was actually germany germany was taken into account so first statement is wrong okay 
Under the deal, Iran agreed to significantly cut its store of all component for nuclear, yes. In fact, before Donald Trump came to the power, it was Donald Trump who uh, in 2018 simply, uh, you know, cancelled this deal. Uh, but it was actually Obama regime that have created this deal, right? And that time even Iran has agreed to significantly cut its offshore, uh, like, you know, nuclear weapons and all that. So yes, the second is correct, not the first one. So you have the answer as the only B answer. So yes, you never know. Sometimes even the old questions can come to your syllabus to make you a little bit nervous. So all this Iran nuclear deal that was signed in 2015, the negotiation started way back in 2013. Okay. Once, once the country agrees to this kind of deal, once uh, Iran has said, okay, I'm, I'm submitting uh, my rights that you can go and inspect my locations anytime you want. So Iran that time actually agreed to all the members that, that I'm going to cut off my, uh, you know, all these things. So yeah, and once you agree, now then comes the part of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is there to support and assist the thing. So next question 18. Again, purely map based question. So I think this one we have done. Huh? This is done. So question number 18 was again a very, very map based question. Again, no guesswork, sir. No guesswork at all. Which of the following latitude in latitude in water is called channel? Latitude we call it on the on the land side, channel is on the uh, this thing, water side. So which of the channel separate India Maldives? Very straightforward answer it is the 8 degree because 9 degree 10 degree 11 these are very famous so talking about india maldives we have, and and of course this was why india maldives because maldives versus lakshadweep remember that controversy all that social media fights all that tourism that was boosted of lakshadweep so very much in the news and that's why this question so don't think or don't take this question only from a random geographical fact but something that actually correlates to your uh, current issues as well. So here the right answer is sub this this was a very very simple question very easy question. So right answer you have in front of you 8 degrees. So you look at this guys 8 degree la uh, latitude is what separates India's uh, mini koi you have the mini koi here and this is the boundary 8 degree you can see this is 8 degree north separating the Maldives islands and India's Lakshadweep islands. So please I request you to be uh, to read about these kind of things more and especially those topics which are in news if anything has to do with India or neighborhood something that relates to India always try to blend the news with a lot of maps sometime you have this combination of map plus news coming so 8 degree channel remember between India Maldives just 1 degree above you have this 9 degree channel which actually separates all the islands of the Mal of the Lakshadweep with a mini koi. Mini koi is the largest atoll that we have. It's the largest atoll that we have. So this mini koi atoll separated from the rest of the islands by the 9 degree channel. This is again important. Further, you have the 10 degree and 11 degree in uh, line. So 10 degree, you for, for that you have to go to Bay of Bengal. Because 10 degree again is a very, very famous uh, demarcation that actually separate the Andaman Island and the Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal. That is 10 degree. You talk about 11 degree channel. One more is there. So yeah, for the 11 degree guys, you really, ha uh, you really have to go uh, and see the separation of Amin Devi and Kananur, which is a part of Lakshwadweep only. So look, if you look at the 11 degree, you have the separation of all these islands so here here you have the distinction so this 9 is there and then you have the degree as the 10 one and somewhere this is your 11 degree north and that separates the Aman Devi and the Kananur both belongs to the state of uh, I mean UT of Lakshadweep right question number 19 is what we have and be careful the question is asking you which statement is not correct okay not correct so we, we have read and discussed the PLI n number of times, production linked incentive n number of times. But this question is another very similar scheme called the DLI, which is design linked incentive scheme, the DLI scheme. 
what we are supposed to learn from it what we are supposed to know about it very important question probably one of the most important question of this test so far so few things that you need you need to remember about the design uh, linked incentive so d i l design incentive linkage talking about this scheme uh, sorry design linked it it has to be dli design linked incentive number 1 this scheme its aim is to offer the financial incentives for the purpose of what for the purpose of design designing and development of the various stages of semiconductor so in india the main purpose of this so called design linked incentive scheme is giving the financial in, in, uh, incentives and the design infrastructure support for the various stages of development and deployment of semiconductor so clearly clearly you have the first sector that is associated with the dli is semiconductor like for example for production linked incentive pli we have got the automation we have got the pharma we have got the mobile and and all that that way but for the semiconductor semiconductor for that you need to have the fabs fabs are the laboratories where they are going to get manufactured but for that you need to have a designing team there has to be designing process semiconductors are very very delicate things to design right and the real the real uh, uh, value addition is the designing part so as to boost the domestic manufacturing of semiconductor first of all it is important to improve the designing part so that india can make its own design without being dependent on any other player number 1 this whole design linked incentive the whole dli scheme has three components one the chip design infrastructure support then you have the production design linked incentive and then you have the deployment linked incentive the three different components under the dli which particular organization is going to implement the dli it is the cdac which is center for De development of the advanced commute computing the cdac it is an autonomous society that operates under ministry of electronic it and technology called maiti which is the nodal agency for the design linked incentive so as far as ministry is concerned it is maiti as far as the center or the or the nodal body is concerned it is the cdac that is responsible and related to the design linked incentive important once very important part to be eligible for the incentives under this particular dli scheme the applicant must maintain their domestic status for the 3 years minimum right so and and these are some other detailed criteria i'm not going into the detail you can simply have a have a reading of that there are different criteria but the most important thing is if you want to take the incentives under the scheme you have to maintain that you are a domestic man, a designer for the last 3 years now if you go to the question barring the exception of the statement number 3 which is correct you will find problem with all first second and fourth why fourth it is not the 5 year the it is just 3 year requirement to be eligible under the scheme does it has two component no we have just learned it has three uh, components and then it says the major aim of the dli is it to offer only financial incentive no not just financial incentives but this scheme also going to give you design infrastructure support as it is mentioned here so what are the objectives of a scheme make all the difference now my suggestion my take for this absolutely very clear this question now the answer is 3 because 3 being incorrect so answer is 3 but my suggestion this was a tough question if you have this question in your exam you need to skip if you are not 100% sure four statements and with every statement they are fully fact based information do i see any of the common sense here i can't i mean how can i decide with my common sense it can be 2 or 3 or 5 or not you know chalo at, at least i can guess this in, in uh, uh, ministry somehow but clearly i am i can't guess all the things with my guess work so that's why this question was being tough one you could have skipped without getting into trouble of the negative marks right 
that brings the last question which is question number 20 with reference to Pradhan Mantri Suryodaya Yojana Suryodaya Yojana it has to do something with solar okay keep that into mind first statement says that the this uh, Pradhan Mantri Suryo, Suryodaya Yojana is actually the extension of the rooftop solar program yes it is uh, the goal is to you know get 40 gigawatt of electricity by only only the rooftop solar program rooftop solar program is not the all complete solar program like for uh, where where do you set up where do you put up your solar panel that is a very key location right now other than the solar parks that we create the government also incentivize and, and encourages the citizens that even we should have some kind of solar uh, fitting on our rooftop where a common man can actually utilize its rooftop as a solar panel fixing point where they can use their domestic electricity from the solar and in the case of surplus that uh, extra electricity can actually be sold out right so this 40 gigawatt is the target but the problem is with the year under the rooftop solar program we are aiming to have the uh, target of 40 gigawatt by 2026 when it comes to the largest rooftop rooftop capacity i'm not talking about the overall largest rooftop solar capacity it is gujarat yes it is gujarat followed by maharashtra okay so in this case which is correct only one is correct that is two only question was a medium one could have been could have been uh, easily solved or at least you can take a little bit of the risk because the question statements are not very problematic few things i would like to add on to your knowledge by this question guys for example now we're talking about the rooftop solar program yes now the year is clear the target is quite clear the roots of this program goes way back to 2014 with the when the present government came into the power it was 2014 when india started the rooftop solar program aiming to increase india's rooftop solar capacities it also wanted to provide financial assistance and it was also giving incentives to distribution companies and individuals so so this objective also can be asked in the question you never know right and when it comes to the only the rooftop solar capacity it is gujarat having the largest capacity followed by maharashtra but when it comes to the total solar capacity it is rajasthan then you have gujarat so please be careful the question is asking you what the total solar capacity or only the rooftop solar capacity when it comes to india and the solar energy you need to know India right now is the fifth largest solar country in the world. Another important fact that can be asked in your question. When it comes to electricity energy consuming country, India is the third largest in terms of consuming the energy. So you may have questions coming from these kind of uh, facts. It's a very, very important kind of question, guys, right? So I really hope you have enjoyed the first part of our test. Uh, four more parts are yet to come. So keep watching PMF IS. And uh, I really want you guys to check out the test series which is given in the link below. And do not forget to give your feedback to this, to this uh, video. Don't forget to uh, share your experience, what all you have enjoyed in this video, what all you have learned in the session. Do let me. My name is Ashish Malik. See you guys next time with the part number two. Till then, all my best wishes for the upcoming exams. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat.